we're talking about what is the finance challenge in the water sector, um, particularly in, under the SDG lanes, and then the conceptual framework on access to commercial finance, why we're talking about commercial finance, and then maximize finance with development, which is the a sort of a set of ideas or principles that the, uh, the World Bank Group we developed uh, in recent months in terms of uh, uh, to mobilize finance for all sectors, not just water, but water clearly is one of those areas. And then I mentioned a few cases in the countries that we're working on and then some concluding remarks. As we begin, we all know, I think sitting here is all water professionals, of the challenge that the humankind are facing in the 21st century, in the 21st century, um, in the water uh, agenda, right? I mean, there are many factors affecting the sort of water resources vis-a-vis -vis the demand. And the key among them, of course, is the population growth and, of course, uh, the climate change impacts. So here among professionals, I don't need to get into the details by why this is a, a really a key challenge. But moving on, from the Millennium Development Goal, moving to the Sustainable Development Goal in 2015 is also giving us another new challenge, which is the fact that if the, in the MDG period, we're talking more about access. Now, in the SDG period, we're talking about safety managed access, which has really different concepts. An example of that is that when you have access to drinking water, but what's the quality of the water? I mean, we have done a poverty, um, worst poverty diagnostic recently in 18 countries in Bangladesh, for example. What's the difference between a, the E. coli contamination in tap water vis-a-vis -vis in pond water? Well, the answer, you may be surprised, is that there's not really different. In other words, when you have access to water, but if the quality is a problem, it doesn't really solve uh, the challenge we are facing. So under the SDG period, we're giving a lot more emphasis about the quality of, uh, uh, of this, uh, this agenda, and of course about sanitation as well. But raising this, this bar means that there will be quite a lot more finance than traditionally be available. So if we continue on the business as usual approach, we simply have no chance to reach the SDG goals. So status quo is not an option. This slide shows you an estimate that we did in 2016 on the paper, which I highlighted there, comparing the MDG period, which is the gray bar, basically investment in the, between 2000 and 2015 in the drinking water and the sanitation breaking up into urban and rural. And that's the amount that we actually invest during that 15 years period. And then the black bar, is that if we remain on the MDG goals, how much it will cost in providing universal access to sanitation and to drinking water, both in rural and urban. And then the blue bar shows a quantum jump in terms of, uh, uh, by the definition of the SDG particular, this is where we only focus on two of those. This is SDG 6.1 and 6.2 about safely managed uh, universal access to uh, drinking water and sanitation. You're talking about the total of this is estimated about uh, $114 billion a year worldwide. Obviously, this is among mostly developing countries because in OECD countries, access obviously is not, a, is not an issue. Now, just to put things in perspective, how does that compare we actually spend um, uh, currently? We're talking about currently among developing countries, we're talking about only spending something like at most roughly about $30 billion a year worldwide. And this is vis-a-vis -vis our requirement of spending uh, $114 billion a year. We're talking about between three to four times of increase. And to highlight, and I also want to emphasize that while in the MDG period, done very well in access to, to drinking water, but sanitation is an area that has been somewhat neglected. So much of the investment, in fact, 60% of these investments, we estimate it, is required is on sanitation, particularly in urban sanitation. I think Bravo yesterday mentioned about the number of billions of people, depends on how you estimate it. So we're talking about between four or five billion people, they have no universal access in the SDG uh, definitions.
So, so how do we finance in the water supply and sanitation sector? The financing equation for the water sector is actually quite simple, and it's not really different from looking at household financing. Essentially, um, you need to finance to cover the cost of expanding, operating, and maintaining services. And for service providers, usually rely on non-repayable funding sources. These are including tariffs, meaning that the amount that user pays. Uh, this includes different forms of uh, of collection, and also about transfers, uh, which is typically from from the tropicals or multilateral bilateral organization. They're providing funding uh, for the water supply and sanitation, and then of course is taxes. The government collect it and then reinvest. In the water supply and sanitation sector, but typically that leaving a financing gap. Mostly, these kind of resources, so-called non-repayable funding sources, not sufficient to cover all the costs, and that's where we traditional have to tap into so-called non-repayable financings. In many of the OECD countries, this has been in practice for the last hundred years. It's nothing new, but in developing countries, particularly in low-income developing countries. Tapping to this、um, non、uh, sort of repayable financing is relatively new.、Um, in fact, those that have been able to use that resources traditionally has been tapping to concessional financing from the World Bank, from IDB, from African Development Bank, and multilaterals and bilateral organizations. The commercial finance part is relatively、uh, minor among developing countries, particularly lower income developing countries. The point we are making here is that if we want to meet the SDG goals, that's an area that we really need to focus on because there's simply not enough concessional resources available or funding from the bilateral, multilateral to meet the large funding gap that we are facing. But if you look at the market, there are different kind of commercial financing is available, and they come from different forms. And depends on the large or small of the utility or the service provider. From household level, the smallest, right? Some household and can access microfinance. For example, Baba talking about Suraj Bara in India. Some of those、uh, household are actually accessing、um, uh, microfinance、uh, for building toilet, for example. And then you to the other extreme is large utility like ISA to SPSB next door. That they can access different kind of、uh, commercial finance. And typically, the smaller the, they they will focus on microfinance or vendor finance, and gradually moving to commercial form of financing like commercial loans from the banks, the loan banks or commercial banks, or issuing bonds. Now, bond issuing is not again is not new among OECD countries, but it is relatively、uh, rare among、uh, developing country utilities. But that's being done. For example, ISA, in fact. Has a plan to issue bonds in the next couple of months, and of course we will come to the case like Sabasbi and others that's been doing this type of finance for for many years. However, the financing is available there, but most utilities that we work with, unfortunately, is not necessary in a very healthy path to access to the finance, because to access the finance you have to position yourself well. But many of the utility we work, for, particularly in low-income countries, are, are in the vicious path. And this vicious path is basically saying that because for whatever reason,、um, uh, start with a government constraint and tariff increase,、um, so a tariff level is very low, and because the price is low, consumer tend to waste the water resources, and this increases the cost of services and enlarges the gap between operating costs and revenues. And which lead to insufficient money for OM costs, and then since service deteriorate, and that decrease the willingness of by the customer to pay, and then they go down the drain. So unfortunately, there are quite a number of utility worldwide that go into this path. So the idea is to to really turn around this utility performance before they can access commercial finance. And to do that, this is nothing new to you,、uh, but we just kind of.、Uh, Calling them in a little bit systematic way is we are talking about the government need to、uh, develop sound policies and implementing institutional regulatory reform to enable utility、uh, to move in reverse that、uh, that vicious path that、uh, we talk about. Like it or not, incentive drives organizations, ministries, providers, 
and individuals, managers. So that's why incentive scheme in the performance utility is very important part of the so-called PIR, policy institution and regulatory framework. And it requires really a holistic approach to address uh, this kind of uh, reform. And many utility uh, in their turnaround path has gone through that process. And fundamentally, when you go through this kind of reform, why you train, uh, there's a three major areas that one has to address. One is about subsidies, and then it's about the sector's own capacity to regulate and planning, and then incentive to manage and staff for increasing efficiency. Now, in developing country like subsidy for water user is a big part of the finance right, in any government policy. At the World Bank, we're not against subsidy per se. However, many of the subsidy schemes, particularly in low-income countries, are not necessarily well-targeted, so they're not necessarily bringing efficiency in uh, promoting efficient use of water resources. Many of the subsidy schemes are based on volumetric uh, scale, meaning that you, you, if you use consumer wa more water, you tend to get more subsidies. But if you look at most urban areas, right, the poor tend to live, in, particularly in developing countries, the poor tend to live in the, in the periphery area. Those are areas that they have no access to basic uh, pipe water, drinking water. So they don't necessarily have, even have access to this kind of a subsidy. While people tend to be wealthy, living in the center, tend to consume more water, and they tend to get more subsidies. So in, uh, in many utilities, the tariff level, because of this subsidy, tariff level is too low to recover operating maintenance costs, not to talk about uh, moving to recover capital costs. On that basis, of course, there's no, basic, there's no possibility to access commercial finance. But many countries recognize that. In fact, um, Argentina, for example, last year increased the tariff for 400%. And uh, you know, it's, it's uh, fairly significant to be able to recover operating and maintenance costs. And many other countries are trying to do something in that nature. And at the same time, during this reform process, again, we're not saying that we're against subsidy, but I think we need to make subsidy much more targeted. And there could be different kind of payment uh, scheme uh, to support that. And then, of course, we talk about uh, incentive already. I'm not going to repeat that. So, by doing all this, we basically want to turn around that path. And to, from the vicious uh, path to a victorious path, this, it is possible. There isn't one size fits all, but this is uh, some idea of the path that one can reverse. Um, usually, the recovery starts with introduction of uh, incentive system in the organization for manager and for staff to make it operational, uh, um, operational relevant. And this will lead to better services. When you have better services, you also typically reduce the non-revenue water. And this will uh, improve the satisfaction of the customers. And they will be willing to pay more. And when they're willing to pay more, they increase the revenue, then will allow the utility to expand services. And then you will raise your revenue base. And then you will be able to move to a uh, uh, full cost of recovery, even with surplus uh, path. And that's where we want to see. And this is a sort of simple picture to show that among the utility worldwide, obviously we have thousands of utilities, they, basically you can see them on these ladders. Right? You have utility at the bottom that are totally unviable, not even able to recover their operating maintenance costs to utility that are fully, cost, cost, uh, fully credit worthy that can access commercial finance, meaning the revenue is more than the operating maintenance cost. They can even uh, recover part of their capital expenditures. The question is that how do we move this path from the bottom uh, to the top? And typically, when utility at the bottom, they will rely on grant financing from budget or from bilateral multilateral. And, but we really want, while this is the case, to work with them to move this path. And along that, then you can bring in uh, concessional finance, we call it a brand finance, and including certain amount of commercial finance when you move to the top. And we have example of utility on all along all these ladders. And on the far right side, I also show there's, uh, there's something we can also use, like in the World Bank, of uh, credit enhancements like guarantee instruments to help utility to move and to reduce the risk 
to get access to commercial finance. So as you can see from this graph, as you move the ladder, you will get more sort of your finance from the commercial source rather than from the grant and, and public sources. So this is really what, uh, in the World Bank, we support uh, this kind of a transition for utility in starting uh, with developing a strategic financing plan, moving to segmented market. We're talking about differentiate, differentiates of the utility and then identify financing need and tailor financing approach. And I'm not going to detail, but for example, um, one survey we did was that the first part is very important. I think utility need to think about a longer term perspective in terms of how they finance, how they meet the universal target. Many countries set out you know, uh, the policy to provide universal access to drinking water and sanitation, but how do you finance, how do you get to that path? So ISA, for example, recently have developed such a plan and they're planning over the next couple of years to invest between four to five billion dollars. So that's the idea, but then the next question, how do you get access to, to that kind of finance? Because the budgetary support is only going to be a small portion of that, and multilateral loan is also a small portion of that. So we're moving, and then segmenting market is really to distinguish the utility based on the performance. As you probably know, working in the World Bank, we develop a database called IBNet that gives you the data among the performance of utilities in terms of where they, uh, how they depend. Uh, What's the degree of uh, credit worthiness? Um, and then the last point about the PIR, the policy institution and, and regulatory framework, is really, uh, uh, I think, want to emphasize is that it has to be a holistic approach uh, to, to, to this reform. And also, we want to uh, emphasize that we don't prescribe one particular model vis-a-vis -vis another, because every country, every utility have to look at their local condition, the political economy, uh, uh, and to develop what is suitable uh, for, their, for their path. So this summarized into this so-called principle of maximizing finance for development that, that the World Bank Group uh, we have developed in, uh, over the last one year. And by the way, this uh, principle applies to all sectors, not just water. In fact, water is probably lagging behind, let's say, compared with uh, renewable energy, compared with you know, part of the transport sector that are moving far ahead in terms of accessing uh, commercial finance. Basically, the idea is that if we have a project of finance for infrastructure, for water supply and sanitation, we first ask the question, is there commercial financing available willing to finance such a project? If there is, then we should use commercial uh, financing that is available for that, that builds the discipline, but also recognize the fact that concessional or public resources is limited. Now, if for whatever reason, possibly because the policy failure or market failure or policy environment is not conducive for getting such a commercial finance, then our support is to work with the utility, work with the government to improve the policy environment and to create that, that regulatory framework that will reduce the risk for commercial finance to get into the sector. And along that path, we can use different, different type of instrument I mentioned here uh, for guarantees, and I'll give you an example from other discounted uh, uh, financing that could be developed. And then for those utilities that are really just obviously maybe in a certain segment of the sector, let's say rural sanitation or rural water supply, that is not easy to get commercial finance, and that's where judiciary you use the limited public resources to provide finance for that. And that's what we call the principle of maximizing finance. Uh, for development. And next, I just give you really, I'm not going to go into detail of this example, but just showing you within this region, what, what I just mentioned earlier is being done in different utility. This is an example in, uh, in Colombia, where they set up, setting up this uh, second tier uh, financing organization called uh, Findeta. It's basically, is, um, the idea of this is to create incentive for Findeta um, for commercial bank to lend to uh, municipalities for water supply and sanitation with Fendata providing a bridge role and providing sort of a discount loan uh, to provide their financing. It's really just to create an incentive uh, to support using moving commercial finance to municipal uh, utility. And this is happening now. Uh, in 2014 in uh, Fendata, 
28% of disbursement is actually for water supply and sanitation. So this commercial finance is actually moving to the sector as we speak. And this is an example in Peru, where we talk about this holistic approach to policy uh, institution and regulatory reform. And this is a, a chart to show the overriding goal is to achieve universal sustainable access to water supply and sanitation. But to do that, the government recognized that they have to have a holistic reform approach to all the major players in the sector, uh, from the policy environment to the uh, water utility to the regulatory body and creation of a water supply and sanitation fund. All these are elements of a holistic reform approach to create that environment so that water supply and sanitation utility can access uh, commercial finance down the path. And this is another example of SBASB, which is uh, really well known in this region. It's you know, SBASB has been accessing commercial finance for many years. You will see the chart, right? 50, more than 50% is owned by, owned by the government, but 49% of it is, has been flowed in the New York Stock Exchange. Recently, they're working with the World Bank Group, with IFC and with us, to actually help them to create a holding company to sell some of the minority assets that we capitalize expanding their capital basis uh, for Sebasti to further expand the services. Again, I'm not going to do it because their colleagues from Brazil can explain to you much more on this. So this is my last slide. Um, we're talking about the fact that we need a greater leverage of limited concessional finance. Um, it's, it's, it's really necessary because based on what I showed, there's simply not enough public sector money available uh, for the sector if we're going to meet the SDG goal by 2030. And to do so, the government needs to create a policy institution and regulatory framework to create the credit worthiness of the utilities. And domestic finance is the key on this because utility uh, receive their revenue on domestic currencies. Of course, it really, you know, if you borrow from externally, you also have run into a foreign exchange risk as well. But obviously, it depends on whether you have a vibrant uh, domestic capital market. And finally, I want to say that the incremental approach is really necessary. Nobody's saying that this is going to happen overnight. It's a path towards um, credit worthiness for the utility and for accessing to commercial finance. And for the World Bank side, we're ready to work with our clients. Many of them are sitting here in this approach. Thank you very much. Thank you.